God. So this month, we have been exploring the concepts of great works, right? Um, and personally for me, I've been greatly blessed by the revelation and insights that doing great works goes beyond performing miracles, signs and wonders, you know? A lot of times we have that pressure, like, oh, Jesus did this, and I should do that. Um, but Pastor helped us to see that whenever we point people to the Father, right, we're doing great works. And I got a chance to reflect on it. You know, when Jesus came, he spoke to thousands of people. But guess what? We have social media so we can be in this room and reach the entire world, which is something that Jesus could not do in his time, right? He could only stay on the seven on the mountain and speak to the people physically in front of him. But you can sit in your room, put a camera in front of yourself, say something, upload it on TikTok, and you would have so many views. People say stupid things and have so many views. So guess what? You can do greater works, right? If Jesus spoke to 5,000 from the comfort of your room with your camera, selfie, you can speak to hundreds and hundreds of thousands, okay? So for me, that was like, oh, so I can actually do greater works, yes. It was very empowering. And then we learned that when you finish strong, you've done greater work. So anything that you do that points people to the Father, ultimately we want to hear the words, well done. That's all. That's all this race is about, right? The words, well done. Today is our first seminar service. And I'm excited because I get to do my day job on a Sunday morning. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, in my day job, Monday to Friday. I'm a human resources professional. So all I do is talk about work, how people work, how people don't work, why they work, why they shouldn't work. I inter interface with employees and managers. I solve problems. Maybe sometimes we create problems along the way. And then we help the organization solve the problems. We hire people and then we fire them. <laughs> Right? And everything in between. So that's my day job. So maybe I'm very excited about this topic because this is my zone. And I get the privilege to talk to my sisters and brothers about how they can be excellent at work. Clap for me. Clap for Jesus. Louder, louder. Okay, so it's an interactive service. So you can see I'm already all gingered and I hope everyone is gingered. I'm going to be looking at your faces. And because it's a seminar, I can call you out. So it's like a like a workshop. I can call you out. I can tell you to read a scripture. Um, so let's let's prepare to have an exciting time. And guess what? Every single one of us is a teacher. So I'm not the only one teaching because everybody in this room has experience at work and at school. So if you look at the pictures on the screen, if you don't see yourself in any of those pictures, put your hands up. Good. Can you see the screen? Okay. Can we all find ourselves somehow in there? So that means everyone is doing something, right? Irrespective of your age, irrespective of your season, everybody is doing something, right? Um, and God is requiring us to be faithful stewards. Um, and there's scriptures. So I get to use scriptures and talk about work only in church beautiful romans 14 verse 12 it says so then each of us shall give account of himself to god so this is the foundation scripture for all of our seminar services so in the different areas of our lives each of us would give account of himself to god so i want you to highlight it you are taking notes i will give account of myself to God. So write that down, okay? Excellence at work. Did I say everyone is teaching and everyone is gonna answer questions? So those of you who brought difficult questions to me, I will just pass it on to all the experience. I think if we look at this room, cumulatively we should have maybe like 150 years of work experience or <laughs> more. So there's enough experience in this room and we have people represented from different professions. We have doctors here, we have engineers, we have accountants, we have students, we have 
So we have pastors, okay. we have diplomats, <laughs> everyone is shouting. We have business analysts, we have future uh, journalists, like we have everybody in the room. So we, I'm sure we will find an answer, okay? So how does this connect to great works, right? Um, simply put, anytime we shine our lights in our places of work and school, we're showing people the Father, and we're doing great work in God's eyes. So we've settled the matter. Even though it's seminar service, we're still connected to the theme of the month. Let's look at Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16. It says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, verse 15. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So what is work? Whatever your hand finds to do. It's the sum total of everything that you do, paid and voluntary, right? So your work in the office, your work in school is work. Your work in church is work. When you help your mom at home, it's work. So everything that you do, as long as your hands are moving, you're doing work, right? Um, a few statements about work. Work has always been part of the original design because we see God creating man and putting him in the garden to do what? Work. What's the Bible word? Tend it, thank you very much, right? Um, after the, work, the, the fall, work just got harder. But work was always there. Agreed? Thank you. We spend a significant amount of time at work. So one fourth of your entire day is spent at work. In fact, half of your productive or waking time is spent at work. Over the course of our lives, we would spend our most active years in one or more workplaces. So our work has an impact on the life we live, the relationships we keep, the actions and activities that form our life experience. Some people met their spouses at work. I'm gonna eyeball them, they know themselves. So work is very important. Some people met their spouses in school. I eyeballed them, right? So that means it's very important, you have to show up. Because you never know. The future may be at work. <laughs> right? They're all laughing and giggling, those who are suspects. <laughs> the future may be at work. So because of our interactions and the amount of time we spend at work, work is an important component of who we are and who we are becoming. God has given each of us talents and I said talent simply areas that we do better than most people. So you may be a good communicator, you may be great at building relationships, you may be good at writing, you may be very creative, you may be a team player, and that's something that you do better than most people that you can show up to work with. So everyone has a deposit or gifting that you can hone to give you competitive advantage in your place of work or school. Like the parable of the talents, God will require an account from each of us. So that's just laying the foundation. I'd like to read Daniel 6, verse 1 to 4. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, and over this three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give accounts to them so that the king will suffer no loss, verse three. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm, verse four. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in 
him. So if you have your notes, I want you to highlight the words that speak of excellence. So in my own notes, I wrote distinguished. So I highlighted distinguished. So someone who is excellent distinguishes themselves, right? I wrote an excellent spirit. So that means there's an excellent spirit. That's the person that shows up and adds value, shows up and says, how can I make this thing better? Um, it says the, the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. That means Daniel was so distinguished that the king noticed, right? Um, and then because he was that distinguished, he upset some people along the way. But they couldn't find anything on him. It's like spotless, right? So I want us to interact with the scripture and I hope you've scribbled some of the things that you see about Daniel. Daniel is actually my workplace mentor because I think of my job a little bit like Daniel, right? Um, and whenever I have challenges at work, like what will Daniel do? <laughs> I go and read on, on Daniel because he, he inspires me. He faced a lot of challenges, but he never gave up. He never compromised. So if you're looking for a work role model in the Bible, look for Daniel. So excellence at work simply means being faithful, to do all that you're asked to do, giving it your best efforts. Um, like Daniel, it's to distinguish yourself. It's to make your work different. It's to elevate your input so that you can get a superior, superior output. It's like garbage in, garbage out. Superior input in, superior output out. It's being fault faultless and without error as much as possible because you have superior work ethics. Can we turn to someone and say, God is actually very interested in what you do? First Corinthians 4, 1 to, 1 to 2, it says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. I think a recurrent theme that I see in scripture is how God, in God's eyes, being successful is being faithful. Being excellent is being faithful. God likes to keep it simple. Just be faithful. What does it mean to be faithful? Keep showing up and doing it with all your heart, with all your might, as unto the Lord. Very simple. But guess what? God is looking for willing vessels that he can put in the marketplace. Because wherever we are is an opportunity for God to shine his light. Right? Um, so now we're going to consider hopefully five points. If not, I have a, a line drawn on the third point because I want to leave some time at the back end for interaction. Uh, so we're going to consider five points. I'm pivoting a bit. Five points as we think about work. So the first one is the purpose of work. And I, I try to frame it like we're having a conversation with God, right? And you're showing up to give an account. So this is God, right? Um, I imagine that the question that God would ask us at this point when we think of the purpose of work is, did you understand the purpose of work? And I imagine that our answer would look a bit like this. Um, I'll share quotes and then I'll go to our answer. Um, this is from late Dr. Miles Monroe. He said, where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Let's say it together. Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. So if you don't know the purpose of a thing, so for example, if you don't know that this phone is supposed to enable you, call Brother Babawale, who is in the next room, you're going to use the phone, maybe you'd put it, frame it on the wall, because you don't know it's a communication device, and then you'll be saying to the person beside you, how can I reach Brother Babawale? And I was like, you have a phone, use it. Okay. Genesis 2, 15 to 16, it says, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. 
Luke 10 verse 7, it says, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. So one of the reasons why we go to work is for livelihood. Work provides us a source of income. That's the basic level. We don't go to work like your real work, not like voluntary work. Voluntary work, in the work, voluntary means it's free. But if you're going to paid employment, the expectation is that you get paid so that you can feed yourself and your family. So that's one of the reasons why we go to work, to meet our daily needs. So that's a basic level. The secondary level, or the higher level, is from John 4.34. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So the secondary reason why we go to work is because our work is a mission field. So we go to work to do the will of God. So the question is, what is the will of God? To reconnect, to reconcile himself to mankind. So when you're at work, you are on assignments. You are to shine your light. You are to shine so brightly that people acts. And because we're in an interesting work environment, those opportunities present themselves differently. Back in my home country, you could have an open conversation about Christ. No qualms. But here, you have to be, you have to use wisdom. <coughs> so part of using wisdom is being there and eyes on the opportunities that show up. When people volunteer information, once they volunteer information, that's ammunition for you. Then you volunteer your perspective from scripture. When they come and they're looking for a shoulder to cry on, you redirect them to how you cope in difficult situations. Like, oh, have you tried prayer? That's what I do when I find myself in this situation. So you, you suggest, right? So it's wisdom. But if you don't know that you're on assignments, when the person comes to cry about how the boss is not being nice, you're going to take advantage of that opportunity to say, oh yeah, I experienced the same thing with the same boss. I supposed to say, oh, when the boss did X, Y, Z to me, I took it to the Lord in prayer. In the of prayer, what, what has prayer got to do with this? Oh, well, you should try it. That's what I do, it helps me. You've planted a seed. But you have to have that awareness that this is my place of assignment, okay? So moving on, the second point to consider. Relationship with and at work. And remember, God is, we're having this chat with God. And God may just say, what was your relationship to and with work? Did you leverage the relationships around you? Did you set boundaries? Or did work become an idol? Daniel 1 verse 3 to 5. My favorite friend, my friend Daniel. I just love Daniel. Oh. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court official, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. What a wonderful job description. <laughs> he was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. Excellent remuneration package. <laughs> they were to train for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. So we can see that there's an for you to be excellent at work, you have to go through training. First of all, you need to meet the job description. So it's important that you know the job description for your role. This role it was important that they were handsome. That's very interesting. <laughs> I don't know that that flies as well. Well, maybe if you're in the fashion industry, I don't know. But a very interesting set of competencies, handsome. That's very funny. Um, so it was important that they were well-trained. So first of all, you need to know the job description of your role. And then you need to prepare yourself or constantly 
equip yourself, ensure that you're well equipped for the work. You can only be excellent if you're well equipped, if you've done the right research, right, to understand the role, right? Have you gotten exposure to the skills required, the competencies? Are your competencies up to date? Or did you go to school 20 years ago like me? And maybe you need a relearning. And maybe I'm talking to myself. Maybe I need to go back to school because it's been a while. But you can also learn on the job. Just kidding. Um, never stop learning. If you want to be excellent, never stop learning. Never stop asking questions. Be a curious bee, right? Um, a person who has the spirit of excellence has a plan. I always tell my colleagues, if you don't have a plan, you would show up at work and execute other people's plans. They will go on to get higher pay, they will be acknowledged, and you would sit back and whine about how you're not getting the right recognition because you had no plan. So when you show up in the morning and someone says, hey, can you help me do this? Because you had no plan, you'll say yes. But if you have a plan, you'll be like, let me look at my calendar. I love that word, let me look at my calendar. Let me see if I can find where I can slot you for that consultation, right? So you have to have a plan. You should approach your work, no matter what it is. And I use the word work, school, whatever you're doing. You should approach it both systemic, which is you have process steps, and strategically, right? That means whatever you're doing, it must be connected to your organization's why, right? So that you can avoid time wasters. How many of you have worked? You're working on a project that is going nowhere, and you know it, but you've refused to ask your manager, is this still a priority? Because guess what? You will do it, your manager will say, oh, thank you very much, good job. And then when it's time for performance, you'll be like, oh, how does this connect to the strategy, the three-year strategy of the organization, and you can't fit it in, which means you just spend the last 12 months wasting your time, right? So it's very important that you go and find out what is the organization strategy, what's the three-year plan, and the work that I'm doing, irrespective of your location on, in the organization's org chat, it's, there must be a connecting dot how do I fit into the big picture? Very important, because a lot of us spend time on time wasters. So that you're working smart and hard. Smart first. So we see God doing an excellent work at that, Genesis 1. If you're a project manager in the house, go and read Genesis 1. That's all the schooling you probably need. Well, go for your project management course. <laughs> but I suspect that the project management courses they went to Genesis 1 and studied God. And then they started, they added like big English to it and made it feel very important. You need to read Genesis 1. Because Jesus, not Jesus, God had a plan for every day. He broke it down and he did similar tasks on the same day. And then when he finishes, at the end of the day, he will look at his work. It's like almost like his, his checklist, he'll do a review. I had 10 things on my to-do list. Check, 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 check. It was a good day, now I can rest. I don't know if you I don't know if you interact with scriptures that way. That's the way I now think, oh, this God is very sharp. Look at his checklist and he checked the boxes and it's like, oh, it's good, I can move on. So which means if it was not good, he would rework it. So the spirit of excellence is open to reworking things, right? You go back to your drawing board and say, uh-uh, this was not an excellent job, right? So let's be like God. When you read the scripture, look at what God did and do it. Relationships, 12 cups of coffee. You say we connect with purpose. When you show up to work, if you watch, if you're a gamer, you know when you wear those, your big, what do they call it? Uh, Curtis, can you help me? Uh, those? VR. Yeah. VR. Yeah? VR. 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 You know how like it projects things like this? So when you show up to work, you need to be able to know who is an ally. It would project on your VR screen. Who is an ally? Who is a, is a key stakeholder? Who is a detractor? So that you know how to invest your time. Who are gatekeepers? Gatekeepers, they are very important. And usually, they are the people that you think are not significant to the organization. They usually sit in front of the boss's office. I'm not going to call any title. And you think, oh, they are sitting in front of the boss's 
you better be friends with them. Their roles are called executive assistants or executive admins. Be their friends, they're gatekeepers. Because if they keep your file under their table, the boss may never see it. <laughs> so just a tip for you. All of that to say, irrespective of the placement of the individuals or in an organization, everybody is important in their own space. And you need to recognize that and respect people, build relationships. Don't show up, oh, I am the director of XYZ. Um, okay, great. Let's see how the boss, the bigger boss is gonna get this file. Or maybe I'll just mess you up a little and not invite you to a meeting and ruffle you up so that you show. Everybody's important, I want us to recognize that. If you are excellent, you'll be able to recognize that everyone is important. And God tells us in his word that we should honor who? Oh. We should honor everyone. class. Yes. We should honor who? Oh. All people. That's where your honor code comes in because you show up as a sharp NCA person and you learned about honor. You know that in an organization, if I want to be excellent, I have to honor all people and build relationships with everyone, right? Um, so 12 cups of coffee, I'm, I'm putting out a plug for 12 cups of coffee. It's a good way to build relationships at work, right? It's simply say, hi, do you want to go for a cup of coffee with me? And that's what people who go far in most organizations do. It's not what happens at the meeting, it's what happens before and after the meeting. And guess where those things are happening? Over a cup of coffee. At least we can take coffee. I know that it happens over some other things, but we can't do those ones, but we can do a cup of coffee, right? Can we all do a cup of coffee? Grab a cup of coffee with a cranky colleague. And you may just realize that they're not cranky. It's actually fun to talk about if it's not work. Matthew 10, 16. Scripture says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Just re-emphasizing how why we should be sensitive um, in our workplaces and use wisdom to navigate the corridors of power. Know the gatekeepers. Be aware that you would always have accusers. So my friend Daniel, he had lots of accusers. Every king that comes, someone would accuse him. I think this time around it was um, him not bowing down to the king's idol or statue, one of those things. And they brought accusations before him. But, you know, when I was studying Daniel, because I'm doing a study on Daniel, I wrote out these words. And as soon as I wrote it in my book, I'm like, oh, this would be nice here. Don't worry. God would use, so I may be speaking to someone, don't worry. God will use accusations to spotlight you. So don't be worried about accusations. Give you a voice to use for him. Provoke your elevation or maybe demotion or exits for a season. So don't be, don't be worried about demotions or exits. There is nothing that happens to you in the marketplace that God cannot use to glorify himself. There is absolutely nothing, promotion, demotion, whatever. If you let God have his way, he would use it to glorify himself. John 9, 4. Okay, I think we've read this. Okay, but I want to read it in a different context. John 9, 4 it says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. What this says to me is, work is work. It is confined to a time, period, and space. Day means when it starts. Night means when it stops. So I know some of us work virtually or physically. But you have to enter into work and come out of work. Work is one of the functions that we do, just like sleep and eating. So don't make work an idol. Establish your sacred times. Times where work cannot infringe in it. So time for God, time for family, time for rest. God rested from the work. God that doesn't need rest, rested. How much more you? So we need Sabbath. If you keep working continuously, you cannot be excellent at work. You will burn out. You will burn out. So you need time to relax and reju rejuvenate. So I encourage you to take your time and go and rest. And let me give you 
a free tip into insider information. So part of the job that I do is I sit in meetings that most people don't sit at. If something happens to you because you did not rest, the organization would have a one minute silence and somebody else would start doing your work immediately. Immediately. Like we would literally just say, oh, let's just have a one minute silence. And then in that one minute, people's brains, they're not even, it's not silence, it's just, <laughs> their brains are thinking of the next agenda item. And as soon as we're done, you're moving to the next agenda item. Free information for all. So let's take our rest seriously. Don't think you are irreplaceable. Because even before you showed up at that organization, there was a replacement plan for you. Free inside that information, I'm just saying. Because they have a business to run. They have salaries to pay. You are important. Say to yourself, I'm important. I'm important. That is why I deserve to give myself rest. Okay. What's your attitude at work? So this is God again saying, how did you show up at work? How did you do your work? What fragrance did you release? What fragrance did you... If your work was a blunt offering unto God, what fragrance will it release? Colossians 3, 22 to 24, it says, Born servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service. Everybody say eye service. Eye service. As men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you would receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So simply said, be faithful. Whatever work you're assigned to do, do it with all your heart. And you know there's a difference between when you do work from your heart. It shows. It shows. Um, Philippians 2, 14 to 15, it says, do all things without complaining and disputing. I remember this from Children's Church. It was a memory verse that we used to say that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And in this one I said, let no one find fault in your work. Do it thoroughly. Ask for help if required. Deliver an excellent product. Have a commendable track record, irrespective of the presence or absence of accolades. Let that sink in for a while. And the reason I say let that sink in for a while is because there was a season in my career when I was working so hard. But I worked hard. But somebody else was getting the accolades. So I don't know. And I recall a colleague said to me, he says, don't fall for the narrative. He says, walk contrary to what is being said concerning you. So that if anybody hears it, it would never align. So I worked harder and harder. But that season came to an end. And when God decided to, he said, when God turned around the captivity of Zion, we were like, what? Man, I'm still dreaming. I feel like I'm still dreaming. Because it was so fast. I did not negotiate. I did not ask. I was quiet. So sometimes you're going to do excellent work and you will not get any accolade. In fact, the there are people that will package it and donate it to themselves as their work. I'm not saying be quiet. Use wisdom. So you should have a pattern of good works. That should be your track record. So what is your track record? Do you have a track record of excellence? Or is it like this? Is that a bell curve? It goes up. Like when you're in a good mood, it goes up. Almost like a roller coaster. When you're in a bad mood, it goes down. And then when they say thank you, it goes midway. So it's like all over the place. An excellent person is consistent. Everyone say consistency. consistency. Have a value-added mindset. Bring creativity and continuous improvement to work. So when you come to work, this was done like this this year. 
Next year, what can we do better? How can we do it differently? That's adding value, right? I think I'll draw my curtain on the third point. Maybe I would have an opportunity to speak to the last two points some other time. Uh, but I'll just roughly speak about the last two points. The last two points are the proceeds of work. Um, so when you work, you get paid. God is actually interested in what you do. And I put them very simple. Um, spend some, share some, and save some, right? And the scripture I like to use to support that is Ecclesiastes 3, 12 to 13, where it says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. So please enjoy the fruits of your labor, right? But save some because there's a, a winter season of your life where you will not be able to work. So put some aside for the winter season of your life. Think of the ants, right? And also give, because when you give, it comes back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaking down. Yeah, it's shaking. Okay. <laughs> Shall men give to your bosom? So remember to give, right? And then ultimately God blesses the work that we do, right? Salary comes from man, blessings come from God. Let's say that to ourselves. Salary, Salary comes, comes from, from man, man, blessings come from God. And God's blessing is all encompassing, which means it goes beyond the financial. It's good health, it's protection, it's preservation. It's a sound mind, it's peace that passes all understanding. It's a good home, it's favor, it's open doors. Another way that God blesses us is by giving us advanced or superior intel. What's advanced intel? Something is gonna happen in your place of work and somehow you just find out. You can't explain how you found, but you know that something is coming and you prepare yourself for it. For students, it could be that you're studying for an exam and you just feel this nudge to stay on page 19 for longer than required, for no reason. You're just on page 19. And you walk into the exam hall and the question number one is page 19. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you've, anyone has had that feeling. I love it. It's just like, bring it on, extra paper. I'm ready for you. That's superior intel. And that's one of the things that God gives us. Sometimes it comes in vision. Sometimes it comes in dreams. Sometimes it's just a strong impression. Right. In conclusion, God expects us to be excellent at work. And being excellent at work is being faithful. It's doing it with all our hearts as unto the Lord. And it's using it as an opportunity to shine. Remember, we will all be accountable to God. Um, it's my prayer that God will bless us with work and then bless the works of our hands. Praise Amen. God.